Welcome. This is Jean Eaton, your Practice Management Mentor with Practice Management Nuggets. I'm delighted that you've joined us today for our webinar with our special guest with Dovel Bonnet. And we are going to talk about passwords today and Dovel's new book, Making Passwords Secure, How to Fix the Weakest Link in Cybersecurity. This is a weekly interview series with practice managers, healthcare providers, or trusted vendors who support healthcare practices. Our topics help primary care practice managers, healthcare providers, and owners to implement, maintain, or improve their business and practice administration so that healthcare providers can focus on providing quality healthcare services. So I am your host, Jean Eaton, the practice management mentor with Information Managers. And I am delighted to introduce you today to Dovel Bonnet. And Dovel is a, an experienced security consultant and provider. He's been creating computer security solutions for over 20 years. His passionate belief that technology should work for humans and not the other way around has led him to create innovative solutions that protect businesses from cyber attacks free individual computer users from cumbersome security policies, and put IT administrators back in control of their networks. Dovel has contributed to numerous papers for Smart Card Alliance organization magazines, including Card Man Manufacturing Magazine, and is the author of the two books, Online Identity Theft Protection for Dummies and Making Passwords Secure, How to Fix the Weakest Link in Cybersecurity. Dovel is a frequent speaker and sought-after consultant on the topic of passwords, cybersecurity, and building secure, affordable, and appropriate computer authentication infrastructures. And Dovel, I want to thank you so much for joining us today, and I'm looking forward to chatting with you for our 30-minute interview. Well, thank you, Jean. It's a great pleasure to be on your show. Um, we have a lot of information that we want to talk about, and I've gone through your book, and I've got lots of questions. Um, but I want to let our audience know to uh, send your questions to us in the chat button or the Q&A button on the screen, or you can uh, send us an email if we run out of time. We don't answer your questions throughout the presentation today. But I do want to also remind you to stay on the line until the end of the call because Dovel has a coupon to offer you for the purchase of the book and a very special opportunity to consult directly with him. So stay tuned to the end of the call to hear about this offer. So, um, Dovel, what has inspired you to write the book, Making Passwords Secure, Fixing the Weakest Link in Cybersecurity? Well, I've always been very passionate about passwords because passwords are secure. And so often when I stand up in front of an audience and I start saying that, I'll get a number of cyber experts, hackers to all start arguing with me to say, no, that's not true. They're really weak. And I'll say, fine, give me an example of a weak password and where that's secure, insecure. And they'll say things like, well, passwords are used everywhere. And I'll say, well, that's a management problem. That's not a password problem. And they say, well, you know, people use uh, their dog's name, their anniversaries. They go, yeah, they do. But that's a password management problem, not a password problem. So it just keeps going on where, you know, the weak, you know, weak, insecure passwords. Again, management problem. Or where IT, of course, will like to go and have it where you have to change your passwords every 30 days. It's now going to be 12 characters long. It's going to be uppercase, lowercase, and you can't use the last five passwords you used before. And again, that's a password management problem because now it forces the employee or the user to start writing them down on white papers or whiteboards, uh, on post-it notes, all those kinds of things. So I decided to write the book to say passwords are secure. What needs to be fixed is the management side. Okay. Um, that is exactly the type of things that I hear when I'm doing privacy awareness training and in healthcare is that we've got passwords. And they're just really hard to manage and to remember and to do them properly. And we're always reminding people that they need to change the passwords and, and that we expect them to use them appropriately. So what exactly is wrong with passwords? Well, there's no, again, it's, it's two sides of it. It is the password as a means of authentication. 
And that's part of this whole concept of multi-factor authentication. And these are the three ways that a computer or how anything is identified, either in physical form or in the virtual world. And that is something you have, which is a card or a membership, you know, something physical, even a smartphone, something you know, a PIN, a password, and something you are, which is your biometrics. When you have just one single form of authentication, card, no, are, it's extremely weak because that can always be acquired by the hacker in one way or another. It's when you start putting two of them or more of them together, it makes it very, very difficult for a person to have all three credentials at the same time. And that's where you start adding in that type of level of security to make your password secure. And all the attacks that have been going on that you hear in the news, and of course I'm here in the States, so I hear much more of what's going on down here than in some other parts of the world. But you probably are familiar with the Target and how they got hacked. Again, it was through social media, social engineering, I'm sorry, where a hacker calls up somebody and they pretend to be somebody and the person just gives out their information because they are fooled as to who they're talking to. Or they'll uh, use um, you know, simple keylogger malwares where you've got people typing in things. So the idea behind securing passwords is not getting rid of passwords, it's getting the human element out of password management. So as the user, you're not having to go and remember passwords, you're not generating them, you're not typing them, you're not even knowing them. And now let IT in the back end handle all of that. Well, I know a lot of users would like to not have to remember so many of the passwords. Um, and and we are our weakest, our weakest link. Um, how do we how do we change this? Why do we need to know about it? Well, one of the things that I do, have done, and I, I'm also the CEO of a company called Access Smart, where we've come up with some solutions. And one of the things that we have done is to use a smart card, which if you're familiar with your credit cards up there, which has the little gold chip on it, or even the uh, phone cards that have the gold chip on it, that's a smart card. So now let's use technology to help us, where all of those passwords are actually stored and encrypted, and there's a term we refer to as salting the uh, hash files and, and salting the passwords, and these are all security ex um, techniques, and I can go over in detail if you would like, but it's using all of those types of infrastructures to make it there. It's very secure. A hacker's not going to be able to get them very easily. I will never say they will never get them, but you're trying to make it so that if they do get it, it's basically worthless information. But now for what we do, we take your existing ID badge, you put it into a smart card reader that is connected to your computer, and you type in a single pin to authenticate yourself there. Now the card is doing the rest of the authentication in the back end, stuffing that the user doesn't know. And then once all that is done, which only takes a matter of a few seconds, now you have your list of all your accounts, and you simply click on which account you're going to, or website, or application, and it automatically launches that application, fills everything in for you, and you're in. And you didn't have to do anything other than just click on what you wanted. And when you remove your card, all your passwords are re-encrypted and uh, they're not accessible to anybody. Okay, so using multifactorial authentication, something you know, something you have, um, will help us with managing how we, how we use our passwords. Well, that helps in managing the password, but it also helps in the authentication that you are who you say you are. Right. Um, for example, we all know about physical security where you have your, your front door to your store, or your office, or to your clinic, and you've got door locks, you probably have an alarm system, you probably, you, know, you might even have gates, uh, CCTV cameras. We're all familiar of how to go and protect that physical door and preventing from somebody to break into the, the office. But companies now and offices and clinics have another front door and that's the virtual front door. So now we have to go and start putting in those security levels and layers that when someone is knocking, as we call, on the uh, firewall or the virtual front door, you now know who they are. 
and that they are who they say they are before you let them pass the firewall. Because once they're past the firewall, they've already broken through the first layer of your security. Right. So we want to make sure that they don't get into that, that first door. Right. And okay. then there's a lot of other security levels and uh, products that are out there that will manage and monitor and be sure that things are not going to go wrong on you. And security and cybersecurity, there's no silver bullet. There's no one product fits all. It's putting all of these different layers in place. Right. So we often talk about layers of, of security. Um, but in your book, you also talk about why it's important to start this authentication before you actually um, boot the computer. So it's not that we need to have all these things for each of the applications. That may be part of that layer. But what do we have to do before we start the computer? Well, when you first start up a computer, and basically it's either the Apples or the Word or the Microsoft uh, Windows applications, and we work mostly with Windows. Uh, when you turn on your computer, the first screen that comes up is your username and password to log into the computer. And so often, that is a very insecure password because people need to remember it and type it. Well, that's your front, your front door. That's the first exposure uh, that a person has into your company's network. So let's go ahead and secure that before we do anything else. With the password manager uh, that we have, and now you're just dropping your card and you type in your PIN so it's something you have and something you know. And if you need it, you can also add the biometrics for the something you are. But now that's authenticating you that you are who you say you are, as well as now having very long, very complex passwords to log into your computer. That again, you're not going to have to know, remember, or type, and the odds of some of hacker figuring them out are quite remote. Um, and now you're in. So now you've, cr you've gone through that first barrier. Next thing is to get into the server, get into the network, all the other components. And again, you go through the whole level of authentications and assurances. And many times you don't even have to do anything more than just click where you want to go. You've already typed in your PIN to authenticate yourself. So let the system, let the computer work for you. Okay, so the cybersecurity starts when the computer first starts. Yes. Okay. Um, all right. So why do we need to why do we need to do this? Why is this so important for how we protect our information uh, of our patients and clients and, and how we protect our business? Well, there's a number of different things that are going on. I mean, a few years back, we all talked about identity theft as being the big problem, where people were concerned about getting their credit card stolen and that using their credit card information or their good credit to go and purchase things. And that's true, and that still goes on to a degree today. But <coughs> identity theft has gotten much more sophisticated, and the data that they're after is much more sophisticated. Um, you hear about some of the new advanced uh, cryptographies that we refer to as with digital certificates, things like PKI and, uh, and such. Well, it's taking somebody's good credit or good name um, that they have established and using that information to for a hacker to then get bogus credentials based off of your name to then insert those credentials to fool networks that it's really, you know, somebody, you know, that it's Gene going into the network when it really isn't. It uh, could be, you know, Snowden going in. So it's now protecting using your information, your personal information. Um, it's also stealing um, healthcare information, where you get the insurance information, all your health information, that uh, people are using that to get hospital care. We're seeing instances where uh, someone's identity, someone's information was, was stolen and used by one hospital to treat and now when the actual patient goes into the hospital, the doctor brings up the records from another hospital because we're now getting all electronic records here. And they said, oh, you're on such and such a medication. I better put you on this right away. Well, guess what? You aren't. It was this bogus person that was. And now you could be given some medication that could actually kill you. And that has happened. Um, we're also seeing where data is being stolen and manipulated, um, where, high, where they're breaking into universities and they're manipulating drug trials and testing, whether for or against something. 
Uh, so there's just a lot more in revol revolving the data and how it's being stolen and manipulated that we have to be con concerned about from cybersecurity. It's not just credit cards anymore. Right. And that's one of the important parts that we need to understand in the healthcare environment is that when patients come to see us to provide services to them for their health care, we need to validate or, or um, use that multifactorial authentication to make sure that the person that's in front of us matches the information that we have in our computers and our paper records. So we ask to get that authorization from the patient by presenting their insurance information and some type of photo ID. So I guess in a way, having authentication for us to access the computers is much the same way. We're using another factor of authentication to make sure that we are who we say we are so that we can access the information. Yes, and you want to build that trust, that circle of trust between you and the physician and the hospital uh, throughout this whole process. That's what it comes down to. Okay. So we we understand from a healthcare perspective that the information is really important. We want to make sure that we've got the right information for the right patient at the right time, and we've got that trust. But it's also a business problem too, isn't it? Yes, it is, very much so. And a lot of times small businesses will and uh, clinics and, and offices, the doctor's office, will say, well, I'm too small of a business for any of the hackers to go after. Well, that's completely false. You're actually who the target uh, the hackers are going after because most likely you're not going to have the layers of security as a large hospital, a large pharmacy is going to have. But you are actually going to be the cyber mule for the hacker. So they break into your system. They uh, enter your networks, they inject bad code, um, they use your email system in order to send out links or to put attachments that have viruses and malware attached to them. And because you're connected to the larger hospitals and to the larger pharmaceuticals, they trust you. And so they will open up your email thinking that it did come from you and then wham, they are all of a sudden hit. Now, one of the big examples I'm sure you heard in, uh, in Canada was what happened with Target, the department store down here. And here was where a, um, the HVAC, which is a heating, air conditioning, ventilation uh, company, they were actually the ones that got hacked and had malware injected into their monitoring software and the accounting software. And so when Target saw that there was an update to that software, they accepted it and said, sure, yeah, all right, put in the update. And that's when the malware got inserted into Target, and then it went through and was able to go and gather up everybody's credit card information. The scary part about this now is that the large Fortune 500 companies, as I'm sure some of the big hospitals up there and pharmaceutical companies up there, are now telling their customers to start putting in higher level of security or they'll be dropped as a vendor, supplier, um, customer, whatever. So now if you're a small business and you're trying to do business and you have a nice big company that you've been selling to, that could go all away because you don't have the security. And when a hack does occur, because a lot of times small companies don't prepare for it, Sadly to say, they go out of business within six months. They go bankrupt because of all the fees, penalties, everything and that's associated with it. And what the average cost we're hearing in these states is now, um, what is it, um, uh, $6.7 million per incident of a identity or a breach. And a lot of people think, oh, that's not going to happen to me. Well, when you start looking at the ROI, of what's it going to cost to recover? What are the lawsuits you're going to have? You're going to lose 30% of your customers. How much money have you already spent on marketing just to get the customers you have? So it's all the direct and indirect costs. When you start adding all of that up, now you start seeing where that high fee gets into play. Right. Um, so the not being prepared for a privacy breach is is part of the problem and then of course when you have a privacy breach even if you are prepared to be able to manage it properly it's still going to cost you some dollars so if you're prepared to manage that privacy breach that's going to help you um, in a in a Canadian context we're finding that the average cost of a privacy breach for the you know relatively small independent practitioner is about two hundred and fifty dollars per person that you need to notify 
Mm-hmm. Yep. Same here. Yeah. Um, and that adds up really quick. And while you're dealing with that privacy breach, you're not dealing with business as usual. So you've Correct. got a lot of lost opportunity happening. Right. You're now having to take all of your marketing dollars that you were going to use to get new customers, new patients, uh, grow your practice. It's now being spent on trying to maintain and recover and uh, sustain your practice. And sustention is good, but you're not going to grow when you're just doing that. Absolutely. So one of the courses that, that Information Managers offers is uh, the four-step response plan to managing a privacy breach. So if you're interested in learning more about that, you can go into the website and uh, you'll see that we have a course online about the four-step response plan. So for the purposes of our interview with uh, today, we'll, we'll leave that aside. But I do want to get back to, you know, the return on investment. We know that it's going to cost us time and money and, and trust factor if we have a privacy breach. So the return on investment, Davil, um, to be able to implement some type of a solution that works for each business, and each business is a little bit different, um, but being able to properly authenticate the user before they have access, um, how does that have an impact on, on the ROI? How can we avoid the cost of doing the privacy breach? Well, that's going to help me. In some ways, putting in security is similar to buying insurance or you know, putting in the physical door. Um, a lot of times you think you might need it, but when you have a breach or you have a problem, you're certainly glad you do. Um, but, <clears throat> you know, there's a number of things that from the ROIs we already talked about are the upfront cost. But there's other things that need to be done, too. You have to go and start training employees. One of the, the tricks that hackers are using, and there's a number of them. We talked about social engineering, where somebody will call up a person and pretend to be IT and say, hey, is your computer running slow? Well, which computer isn't running slow? And so they say, well, yeah, well, I've just been hired by your IT department to go and fix this, and I need to get into your network and, and monitor what's going on. Will you please tell me your username and password? And so many people will say, Oh, well, sure. We're also seeing reports that, and this was really scary, that 20% of employees are willing to sell their company's passwords or their account passwords for under $1,000 because they want that extra money. Um, there's also the Good Samaritan attack, and this is really funny, is that the hackers will drop these little USB thumb drives in the parking lot or in the lobby, you know, someplace in the public area, and a good Samaritan comes along and sees it. And says, oh, well, this belongs to somebody. I've got to give it back to them. And they take it and they plug it into their own computer so they can see who it belongs to or try to figure it out. Well, guess what? That's where the virus is, and they just injected that into the network. I so, have not heard that one. That's that's <laughs> that's scary. Yeah, yeah. And of course, then you know, we talked about the phishing emails of, uh, you know, someone clicking onto a link. And so what having a secure password management type system where it's always checking those links, like in our system, if someone clicks onto that link and tries to log in, our card is not going to recognize that link because every URL is going to be different. So therefore, we don't, re we don't uh, send out the username and password. We don't relinquish it. And uh, this way, if somebody does it, they say, wait a minute, why am I not logging in? Okay, let me not go through the link and let me use my card to see if there really is an issue. So that's another way to get around, you know, to be able to put yourself in there. But the ROI is really there. Um, and many times the IT people, when they're trying to go to upper management to, to explain why they need more security, they don't talk in ROI. They talk in geek talk, you know, bits, bytes, security, encryptions, this and that. And the CEOs and CFOs don't know what they're talking about. And so we have to get the IT people to understand how business decisions are made and how ROI plays an important part of that and how you calculate and determine. And that's one of the things we covered in the book for the IT side. Okay. So the book is, is very easy to understand. It's, it's not written in a lot of what I call geek, because I don't speak fluent geek. Um, and, and I'm reading through the book, and I'm, I'm saying, yeah, this makes sense to me. So it, I like the way that the book is written, Davo. I think it's very informative, and it leads 
the reader to the next step. So you told us about the risks of not being able to authenticate people. We've told us about the the, um, the risk to the business and to providing safe care for our patients, which is why we're why we're in this business in the first place. Tell us about the password authentication infrastructure. If we read the book and we say, yeah, we need to change the way that we, we manage our front door, what, what do we need to know next? Thank you. We, we came up with the term password authentication infrastructure because it's really much more than just having a password manager or a little piece of software or some commercial type uh, product, consumer product. It's putting in together a complete infrastructure and we leverage off of what companies already are using. We don't want to go and do this rip and replace infrastructure that uh, some other technologies do require. Now, is it that PAI is better than a PKI or a symmetric key infrastructure? No, they are leveled at different types of audience and users. And so you're trying to match things. But with a PAI system, you of course have the card and you've got the smart card reader. So there you've got some hardware. Well, if you can plug something into a USB port and drop a card into a slot, that's how technical you have to be. Um, then there's, of course, the password management software side, but there's also an administrator component to that, which the IT people have, so they can start managing it. Okay, so now there's the, the software portion. Now we start getting into much more of the encryption and the ciphers to be able to protect the data. And we're using advanced AES encryption, we're using SHA-256, and there's this term called salting your passwords, and this is where um, you're using a unique number to generate the code of your password that actually the computer uses, which is a hash code. And I know I'm getting a little geek talk there, but we go through this in the book in, in poor, simplistic terms. But this way now, if everybody used the exact same password, let's say password, because that's one of the most common ones, to the hacker, he would see a file that had different numbers, different uh, codes, uh, values, even though they're all the same. So he would not be able to, or she would not be able to go and decipher what actually is the password um, for their account. So it's putting this all these different components together. PKI, public key infrastructure with the certificates and public private key is very secure and very strong. It has a lot of expenses and, and it can be cumbersome to implement. Um, but it doesn't mean that it's not good. Um, but what keeps those secure is how they protect that private key. If the private key is ever compromised, all that security goes out the window. So why not use a lot of that same infrastructure and technology to protect your passwords as you protect your private key? And that's the, the route we took. Okay. So we need to protect the, that password be um, at, at the beginning when the computer is being turned on. Correct. As well as all your websites, applications, servers, wherever you use a password, that has to be protected. Okay. Um, there, There's so much more to ask, and I'm really glad that you've got the book. It's now available <laughs> on Amazon. So if you need more details, you can go to the book on Amazon. Um, mm -hmm. So what else do we need to know as, as we need to wrap up for our 30 minutes, because it goes by so fast, um, before we let you go today, Dafa? Well, I mean, as you said, there's so much more to go over all of this. And all right. So the book is now available on Amazon in both the soft cover, and I've downloaded mine as a Kindle, as a Kindle version. Mm -hmm. And yes. uh, the, the Kindle version is nice for... For, for those of us who like to read things electronically, so just so everybody knows, you don't have to have a Kindle reader to get the Kindle book. You can still download it as an electronic version and, and see it on your on your PC if that's the way that you prefer to do that. And uh, it works on, on many other different devices. Just kind of wrapping up, it's really knowledge. Knowledge is the best defense against all of this. And so that's what I'm hopeful that this book gives you is that level of knowledge to start protecting your networks. Okay. Now, you've, you've also given us um, a, a great opportunity to be able to connect with you directly. Um, as you said, everybody's solution is just a little bit different, and there's no one silver bullet that's going to work for everybody. Um, so tell us about the opportunity to connect with you directly. 
Well, a lot of times I like to say they're one common element or denominator when it comes to network security is that there is no one common denominator. Everybody has something different in what they're trying to do. And it's not so much that you're trying to customize everything. It's just more of understanding your environment. And our solution is very flexible at that. But there's a lot of different things people want to go and add on. And so instead of trying to just push out a product, I'd rather go and talk to you, figure out what you're trying to do, what's your problem, and how do we best solve it. So I'm offering a one free one-hour session uh, where I usually charge a lot of money for consulting services for this, but now it's just what can I do to help? And even if we don't sell a product and our solution isn't the right one, then I will tell you where some other solutions are and other products and where you can uh, purchase that if I, at all possible. So it's not about me selling my solution. It's about you helping to solve your problem. And that is so valuable. There's so many options. Now that we know where the pain is and that there's a solution for the pain, now we have to find the best solution that's going to fit for, for our organization. Exactly. So you just need to go to my, the website, Making Password Secure. There's a button there for contacts, and in the contact, just put in there one-hour free session, or free one-hour session um, in that section, and uh, I will see the email come to me, and then we will uh, connect. That is fantastic. And that's a special offer for um, the folks that have joined us for Practice Management Nuggets. Um, Bravo, we we're running out of time, um, so I want to give you the one last chance to, to wrap up. Is there anything else that you'd like to be able to, to share with the audience before we, we, before we move on today? Well, again, it's you know, education, knowledge. Um, you know, computers can be secure. Passwords can be secure. This is all required now, and it's now just being able to understand what you can do, that there are solutions. You need to start putting them in place. Um, and we can go and start breaking some of these uh, hacks now and stopping them. That's wonderful. Thank you very much for joining us for Practice Management Nuggets. You've shared with us about why we need to secure our front door. Uh, we've talked about different ways about securing that front door and really emphasizing that we are, we are our weakest link and that we can put those layers of safeguards in place to protect our patients, their information, and our business. Thank you very much, Dovel Bonnet. I'm delighted that you joined us, and uh, I wish you a fantastic day. Thank you. It's a pleasure being here. This is Jean Eaton with Practice Management Nuggets. I'm so delighted that you joined us today and invite you to join us again for our next uh, expert coming up. You just need to go on to our website to see the next expert and our next interview. And you can always sign up for our weekly reminders so that you don't miss um, a valuable practice management nugget. Stay tuned. <laughs>